Uh, my name is Sharon Short, and I'm a writer. Uh, I've been presenting here at this wonderful workshop. I'm a Dayton native. Um, the weather is always weird. Just, just saying. Um, I'm the director of another workshop uh, now held at University of Dayton, the Antioch Writers Workshop. And it's my pleasure today to introduce to you John Grogan, our keynote speaker for lunch today. Now, John probably doesn't remember this, but we met briefly in 2006 at the Midwest Booksellers Convention. I happened to have a humorous mystery just published by William Morrow. And John happened to have a memoir with the same publisher. You might have heard of the memoir. <laughs> it's called Marley and Me. Uh, we didn't chat for very long. Uh, John was soon surrounded by fans and booksellers. But the thing was, I couldn't even be jealous uh, because I observed how gracious and genuine he was with each and every person who approached him. So I brought home a copy of Marley and Me and was, again, struck by those attributes, genuine, gracious, that shone through in how John and his family uh, loved dear Marley. And at the time, we had a beagle, Cosmo, a rescue dog who would have cheered on all of Marley's antics. Um, and as I read, I have to confess, I laughed until my abdomen ached. <laughs> But at the end, I curled up with my arms around our dog, crying my eyes out. So the memoir has gone on to incredible and well-deserved success, a film adaptation, 76 weeks on bestseller lists, over 5 million copies sold in 30 different languages, and spin-offs of children's books. Next came his coming-of-age memoir, The Longest Trip Home, published in 2008. Though I'm from a very different background, I was again moved by his words to both laughter and tears as I related to his desire to find an identity separate from his parents, yet connect to them. Um, hear those words again, graciously and genuinely. The second time I met John was in 2012. I'm pretty sure he remembers that because he was our keynoter at the Antioch Writers Workshop. He joined us again two years later to teach our morning classes in nonfiction writing. And the defining attributes of our experience with him, catching on to a theme here, gracious and genuine. So it's now my genuine pleasure to introduce you to John Grogan. I'm guessing he's going to make us laugh, maybe even make us tear up a little bit. But I know he'll be gracious and genuine. John Grogan. Thank you, Sharon. That was wonderful. Thank you, Sharon. I'm really not gracious or genuine at all, but, but I'm going to run with that. <laughs> um, so thank you for having me. This is really an honor and, um, and wonderful. I really can feel the excitement in the room. And coming down the elevator last night, it was like stand-up comedy uh, from floor six down to one. <laughs> so it's great. I'm glad, I'm glad to be part of this. Um, I still can't quite believe I get these invitations. I had to sort of pinch myself. Uh, the first time I had this experience, I was, uh, my book had been out. <clears throat> it was starting to climb up the New York Times bestseller list. And I looked out through a slit in the curtain, and there were like 800 people out there. And I had some time to kill, so I went out into the lobby where they had a coffee service set up. And I was like, wow. I mean, like, you know, six months ago, I could have gotten coffee anywhere. And then just as I'm thinking that, this woman clearly sees me, and she starts beelining towards me. And I'm like, well, see, there you go. I mean, I can't go out for coffee anymore because now I've got a book out and I'm on the bestseller list. And so she made her way up to me. And I was actually reaching for my pen to sign her napkin for her. And she said, um, sir, uh, we're out of sweet and low over here. <laughs> so yeah, uh, the uh, high ego uh, uh, life of being on book tour. Uh, I got to stop dressing like a waiter, I guess. So as we were driving over here, I was thinking about how I ended up um, finding a voice with uh, a humor as part of my voice, mixed with pathos and other things. And I, I, you know, I had to start by thanking my mom, uh, one of those typical Irish Catholic matriarchs who uh, ran the household, made all the decisions. Uh, she also had like um, a really uh, sadistic sense of humor. And, and it wore off on me. Um, you know, what kind of a mother would uh, ask you to come give her a kiss 
and when you lean in to kiss her, you get this sharp pang, and you see that she has a needle in her teeth <laughs> as, as a funny little, as, and then she would laugh her head off. One time, <clears throat> yeah, one time she uh, asked me if I wanted to see the cosmos through a winter coat sleeve, and she said, yeah, I have the magic incantation. You get on your knees, and I'm going to put the winter coat over you, and you look up the sleeve. And so I'm sitting there like a dummy, about eight years old. She goes, do you see the stars yet? And I go, no, no. And she goes, how about now? And she threw a glass of water down the sleeve into my face. <laughs> so I think, you know, she was a very loving woman, and it was all done <laughs> with humor. I call it sadism with a smile. Um, but I think her lesson was like, you know, it's not, a nice, it's not an easy life out there, and you've got to have a thick skin. And she did her part to make sure I had a thin skin. Uh, thick skin, rather. Um, and also, um, you know, you got to laugh at yourself a little bit and be able to bounce back from these things. She was also a really good storyteller. Uh, she never went to college, never went to a writing workshop like this, but she just from growing up with the cadence of stories around the kitchen table, she had developed this really good voice. And, you know, she had her escalating action on the narrative arc and the plot twists and everything. And, you know, she, she was like a textbook storyteller. Didn't have a clue what she was doing, but she was just a natural at it. I think if she was here, she'd probably allow that a little bit of that gift of gab of hers wore off on me. Then the next thing I thought about were the nuns. I went to a Catholic school in the neighborhood, and the nuns were an important part of me developing a, a humor voice because the, huns, the nuns had absolutely zero sense of humor. <laughs> Dour, straight face, um, serious, uh, sometimes angry, um, which of course is a great backdrop for trying out your best humor. Uh, by the time we got to eighth grade, you know, some kids were known for their academic excellence and some for their athletic prowess and some for their incredible science project. I was known for one thing, and it was the amazing exploding milk carton prank of sixth grade. <laughs> We had this nun, Sister Flementia. Uh, she was about 104, and I think she was shrinking every year because by the time I got her, she was about four foot two. And I knew it was predictable. Every day, a, as the kids got restless just before the school let out, she would pull a pin out of her habit, out of the little bale thing, and she'd say, I want to hear a pin drop, and then she'd do a countdown. So I had, you know, so the timing was easy. So one day I folded up my empty milk carton and had it down by my foot. And she said, I want to hear this pin drop. And three, two, one. And the explosion heard round the school. <laughs> that little nun almost went through the ceiling tiles. <laughs> so yeah, I spent quite a bit of time in detention at Our Lady of Refuge. Um, the normal punishment for me was uh, I had to write like 500 times that I won't misbehave. And, um, my parents were so proud. I was the inventor of the five pencil cheating tool. <laughs> where you take five pencils and you stagger them at an angle and you tape them. And then you can write, I shall not be bad. <laughs> and you can do five for one. And it goes much faster. <laughs> the nuns kind of figured that out pretty quickly. Um, so then uh, one of the sisters gave me an assignment. Uh, I think it was in seventh grade. And she said, I want you to write an essay about why your Catholic education and it's so important and should be taken more seriously than you take it. And like this was, you know, like this was like hell. And, but I knew I couldn't leave until I did it. So I started writing and I'm sitting there alone after school in this classroom. And I realized I'm having fun. I was skewering everybody. I was skewering the nuns and the priests and the classrooms and the kids and myself. Um, and I had a good time writing this thing. I'd never really tried writing something down before. And when I handed it in to her, to her credit, she, she didn't laugh, but she also didn't rip it up. And I remember her saying something like, maybe you should think about writing more. And uh, I showed it to one friend, and he started laughing, and he showed it to another. And pretty soon, this little detention essay went around the school. And I'll tell you, that felt powerful. It felt good. It was the first time in my life that the screw-up Johnny Grogan had done something that other people actually thought had any value. And that was the day that I thought, maybe I could be a writer. And 
And maybe I could incorporate humor into my writing to try to tell stories that make people react like this. It's a good feeling. So from that point forward, I was kind of looking, mining my life, like I think everyone in this room does, mining my life for situations that could be written about. And of course, with humor, right, the more awkward, cringeworthy, uncomfortable it is, the better the material. So no matter how bad things got or how awkward, I would say, yeah, it's horrible, horrible, but it could make a good bet. And so I'd stash these things away. And that kind of makes me uh, flash forward a little bit to um, getting married and uh, the night that my new bride and I honeymooned in my mom and dad's Catholic bed. <laughs> we didn't plan to. That was not on the newlywed agenda to do. But you know, we were living in Florida, working in Florida. My parents live up near Pontiac, up in Michigan, just north of here. And uh, we came up, we got married in Detroit, and then we went on a nice honeymoon to Toronto, and we came back, and we just had one night. And then we were gonna get up in the morning, one night at my parents, and we are gonna drive back to Florida. And uh, in the past, of course, before marriage, you know, we'd be in separate rooms in opposite corners of the house with the, the doorknobs electrified to <laughs> prevent any kind of midnight hanky-panky. So we assume, like, well, we're married now, so we'll get to sleep together on the fold-out couch down in the basement. We walk in the door, and my mom has other ideas. She says, I got our room all fixed up for you. And Jenny and I both are like, no, 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 no that's fine. That's fine. The fold-out, no, no, I insist. And Jenny's like, no, I insist. We're not, we're not going to take your room. We're going to sleep on the couch. No, I insist. You'll be more comfortable. It'll be more private. And I looked at her face, and I knew what my mom was thinking. And it was grandchildren. <laughs> and then I looked at Jenny, and she had kind of entered this gray-faced, catatonic state. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, my mom had us up in her room to show it to us. And I could see why she was so insistent. She, she put a lot of work into it. It was all fixed up. She had fresh flowers on the bureau. She had her best towels out. The sheets were folded back, and I could see they'd been ironed. Two little foil-wrapped chocolates on the pillow. <laughs> and she said, you know, this bed has been very, and I almost <laughs> leaped over the bed, tackled her, put my hand over her mouth. No, Mom, do not say, very lucky for your father and me. <laughs> Jenny's catatonic state deepened. <laughs> I hustled my mom out of the room and closed the door, and I'm like, you know, it'll be okay, right? And she said, you will not touch me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and then I looked around the room, and I realized there was one thing my mom had neglected, and that was to remove the roughly 240 religious icons from the room. <laughs> there were five Virgin Marys. <laughs> The one in the corner was almost life-size. <laughs> the Pope was looking out from a frame on the wall, staring benevolently at the bed. The crucified Jesus was on the cross with blood streaming down his face. There was a Bible on each side of the bed. And the piece de resistance, there was this giant, like four-foot-long rosary hanging from the bedpost. <laughs> and the beads were like the size of walnuts. I sat on the edge of the bed, and it clanked loudly. And I said, so we're going to make the best of this. And the way my mind works is that means let's make some jokes about this. So I just started rocking a little on the bed to get those rosary beads <laughs> whacking. I thought it was hilarious. I thought it would like lighten the mood and uh, just Jenny did not find it amusing. <laughs> I had to convince her to um, put her suitcase down. She was not walking back to Florida in the middle of the night. So yeah, it was one of those moments that, you know, at the, at the time really makes you feel like, oh, God, families, it's just so painful. But then it became a chapter in my second book because it was one of those moments. And it was sort of a story uh, that I remembered that was worth telling. And of course, um, if you're looking for fodder in your life, 
it doesn't hurt to bring into your family home that you just spent a lot of effort uh, fixing up and revarnishing the floors and everything, bringing in a uh, wild, manic Labrador retriever who's been diagnosed with mental illness. <laughs> and you've probably heard, heard of him. That, was, that would be Marley. And you know, we brought him into our lives when we were just starting to figure out what our lives would be. We had only been married uh, months. And you know, we were basically kids trying to figure life out. And we brought this crazy big dog into our life. And he just he shredded everything, uh, including our sense of what normalcy was. He jumped through the screens. He scratched up the floors. He dug right through the drywall. We, we'd come home from work, and the pink insulation would be sticking out of the walls. Uh, he was just a really crazy dog. Um, we put him in obedience school, of course. That's what you do, right? How many dogs flunk out of obedience school on the second day of class? <laughs> the teacher just said, I can't deal with this dog. He dragged her across the parking lot. Um, <clears throat> I kind of was proud of him, though, because she was very haughty about it. And she's, you know, I couldn't control him. And she said, give me the leash. You know, she had this attitude. And she took him, and she put him in a set, and he sat, and then she said, heel, and off they went. And he just, <laughs> he pulled her, and she, you know, she couldn't control him. So we took him to the vet, and he diagnosed him as having ADHD. <laughs> and he, he, he really did. And he gave us this little bottle of tranquilizers, and he said, don't hesitate to use these. Um, Fairly early on in the relationship, uh, I'd given Jenny this little gold chain for her birthday. And she put it on. And she was like, oh, this is great. I love it. And then a few minutes later, she's like, oh my god, my chain's gone. The clasp must have not been hooked properly. And I'm like, well, it's fine. I mean, we haven't left the room. It's got to be right here. And that's when we noticed off in the corner, it was Marley. And he was doing this little dance he did when he was up to no good. And we looked at him. And sure enough, there's this little slip of gold sticking out of his jowl. So without saying a word, we were already kind of figuring out the drill. We started circling him from opposite directions. We, we were like the, uh, like the bomb squad. I actually heard my new bride say, Marley, drop the chain, and no one gets hurt. <laughs> we got within about two feet of him, and we both lunched at the same time. We grabbed him, we tackled him, and he threw his head back, and down went the chain. <laughs> So we just had a nice lunch, so I don't want to be real graphic here. But I can tell you, I got that chain back. It took three days of following him around with a garden hose and a shovel. And it was shinier than the day it went in. So shortly after that was his famous ride to be castrated. Um, the vet said, you know, you really need to do this. And not just to calm him down, but to stop this gene line at all costs. <laughs> So Jenny really quickly jumped on this as solution. As a fellow male, I was having some hesitation, and I was feeling kind of guilty about it. So we get him out there. He leaps in the car with great joy. We're taking a ride. He trusts us to do the right thing. And Jenny's driving. I'm in the passenger seat. I'm feeling guilty. So I roll the window down a little bit, and he crawls across me. He sticks his nose out. So I roll it down a little bit more, and he sticks his head out. And I'm like, oh, God, he's getting his balls cut off. <laughs> so I, I rolled it down like two-thirds of the way. And his paws are out, and his head, and his shoulders. And, and Jenny's like, this is making me nervous. And I was just about to say, how dumb do you think he is? Do you really think he's going to jump out of a moving car going 40 miles an hour when Marley jumped out of the moving car going 40 miles an hour? As he slithered past me, I managed to grab his tail. And I'm holding on for dear life, three quarters of his body's outside the car, his giant intact scrotum right in my face, <laughs> like this. <laughs> Everyone's honking, we're breaking in the middle of traffic. I mean, this isn't a country road, this is a five lane, you know, city highway. Uh, we finally got him to the vet. I was like, my guilt was miraculously gone. <laughs> I said, Doc, give him the works. <clears throat> So on and on, you know, I mean, he jumped over the fence one day, and he came back an hour later, and he had this giant pair of women's underpants in his mouth. <laughs> and I did not want to know where they came from. <clears throat> and that's when I instituted the don't ask, don't tell policy in our house. Um, 
one time, uh, you know, we were trying to get pregnant, and I don't recommend for like conception purposes having a Labrador retriever with his chin resting on the side of the bed looking at you. <laughs> but regardless of that, we got pregnant, and uh, we were hugging with the pregnancy test strip on the side of the sink, and we we're like, oh my God, we're expecting. And um, Marley ate the test strip, as you can probably <laughs> imagine. But we didn't care, because we were happy. Uh, a few days, well, a few weeks later, um, that, that uh, pregnancy ended in a miscarriage. And uh, so it was a sad day for us, of course. And when we, uh, I brought Jenny home, and we got inside the house. And then I went to let Marley in. He stayed out in the garage, which he had totally destroyed. I mean, it looked like a bomb had gone off out there. And my, the normal routine was you open the door, he comes racing in, takes a big drink of water, and then continues through the house throwing water and saliva everywhere. And that's exactly what he did this time. And uh, I was a few seconds behind him. And when I turned the corner into the living room, I couldn't believe it was the same dog. And this was sort of like the first time I saw this sensitive side of our, of our crazy mud. Uh, he was just standing perfectly still with his, his uh, shoulders in between Jenny's knees, and he was resting his head on her lap and just sitting there perfectly silent. His tail wasn't even wagging. And she'd been you know, very brave through this whole day, and there was something about that sweet moment of human canine empathy that uh, you know, I just, could just picture it. She just wrapped her arms around him and buried her head in his fur and, and began to cry. And that's when I sort of thought, like, this dog might make it in our family. <laughs> and he did. So, you know, I started telling these stories around the drinking fountains at work and at dinner parties and to the neighbors. And, uh, you know, clearly people would laugh at these stories. And I was sort of, you know, as a writer, I was getting this idea, like, you know, there's got to be something here. I just don't know what it is. Uh, but I kept kind of gathering these stories just like I had been doing since I was a kid and kind of trying them out. And some went over better than others. And, but they were all true stories, although I did find I was being selective. I wasn't telling the sweet Marley stories. I was telling the, the stories about his bad boy personality. But I didn't really know quite to do with that. Um, so fast forward a little bit. And you know we get new jobs. We move from Florida up to Pennsylvania. And Marley's getting to be an older dog. Yet still mischievous, you know, he was like hard of hearing and his hips were getting bad and all this. But one day I came home from work and I was there alone. And uh, Jenny and our ch we had three children by now, they were out and there was no Marley in the house. And I'm like, Marley, Marley, where are you? Nothing. And so I go upstairs, he's not up there. I come down in the hallway, I can look into the kitchen and there he is, he's pretty deaf now. And I can see he's up, he's got his front paws up on the kitchen table and he's eating all the grilled cheese sandwich remains that the kids had left. And I thought, you know, I could just go punish him or I could try a, an experiment. So I'm gonna see if he's really deaf or if he's faking. Because he's like <laughs> deaf whenever we'd give him an order, but if he heard a piece of meat drop, he'd like come running. <laughs> So I walked up behind him, and I got like you know three feet behind him, and I'm like, Marley, Marley, and just he's eating away, and I snap my fingers, and he looks up, and he's staring at that back kitchen door where he knows they would come in from the garage, and he's staring at the door, and then his tail starts going again, and he's like, No, this is I I think it was a false alarm, and he's <laughs> and he starts eating again, and I just reached out with one finger and I just tapped him on the shoulder. That dog went into, like, he spiraled down to the floor with his paws off. And, I'm so sorry. I couldn't help it. So I couldn't really punish him. I had to laugh at the moment. But it was that moment where I, where I realized that, um, that you know, he wasn't faking and that you know, his, day, his days were limited. And uh, so he grew kind of comfortably old with us. And by now, I'm a columnist at the, at the Inquirer. And um, you know, if you saw the movie, Marley and Me, uh, the storyline the story is that I was this sort of like hapless, uh, incompetent of a journalist until I, <laughs> until I started writing about Marley. And then my life changed dramatically. 
And then that's all I did for the rest of my life was <laughs> write columns about Marley in a daily newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer. You know, they would allow that. Um, <laughs> But no, I mean, I wrote probably a half dozen columns over, over several years. Uh, but I did, I did learn something. I learned that they were popular. I learned that the more I put myself in a column, the more human reaction I got from readers, the more I took myself out of it and tried to be more like uh, a reporter essayist, uh, the invisible voice. The, I, I, it was palpable how the reader response would go down. Uh, so readers were basically guiding me as to how to establish my voice. When I tried to be funny, when I tried to be personal, when I would admit my own personal weaknesses and foibles or talk about my family, uh, they rewarded me. And if I tried not to do that and try to be the serious journalist, not always. You know, um, you know I could write about the broken school system, really important issue, and I'd get like, two cranky emails, um, or I could write about something about my family, and I would get you know, a couple hundred. And so that was another shaping force for me as a writer. Um, there's like nothing like reader feedback to kind of, just like I guess for a stand-up in a club, you know, you know if people aren't laughing, you know to move on, and when they laugh, you know that you're hitting it. And I was getting that equivalent, but through letters and emails and phone calls. Um, I was kind of figuring out that just writing humorous bits wasn't enough. I wanted to write a book. Like every journalist in the world, I dreamed of writing a book, and I didn't know what it was. I, uh, but I knew I had this good material, and it wasn't just about a dog, a crazy dog with ADHD. It was um, about a couple, about a young couple growing up and figuring life out. And with this dog in the mix, which was the catalyst to challenge their assumptions on what, quote unquote, their comfortable life was going to be. So I was kind of like three quarters of the way there, but I just didn't really, there wasn't a story there. And I hadn't figured out yet that, that the humorous bits, at least in a memoir, they're not enough. They got to be tied into a framework of a bigger story, it's a story that somehow reflects on the human experience and has some kind of takeaways and truths about what it means to be human and to live in this world and to have relationships. Um, when I finally figured that out, um, it was at the very end of his life. And uh, he, he came, there, a time came where we knew that uh, we were going to have to uh, have him put down, that he was just, you know, he was getting too old and, it just, and he was in pain. And, he had a medical crisis, and so I took him in, and uh, you know it was a it was a really painful day. I mean, I was surprised at how painful it was. Um, being a person who thinks like, yeah, he's he's just a dumb dog, you know, but that's easy to say until you're sitting with that dumb dog ready to say goodbye to him. And while we were waiting, I you know I had time to reflect, and I was thinking about. Uh, like uh, the gifts and the joy that he brought into our family and the way he had changed us. And he really did change us in profound ways. Uh, you know, like a dog like him, you know, he, he taught us as young people that you really can't be, it can't be all about you. You can't be selfish. It was, it was good training to become a parent. He taught us that zip codes don't ma matter and income and how fancy a car you drive. You know, you judge people by their hearts. Uh, and then also like simple pleasures and you know taking a nap in in a warm sunny room on a on a winter's day or taking a walk in the woods. These were all things that I kind of figured out with this dog at my side. Um, when the time came, I had just a few minutes, and I realized that there was something I wanted to say to this guy. That you know, for his whole life, I've been trotting him out uh, about the bad boy behavior, and I even make cracks about there uh, there should be a lemon law for dog owners that so you can get your money back. But there was more to that dog, and I mean, I only told you about one of them, the 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 moment after the miscarriage. But there were a lot of those moments mixed in with all this incorrigible behavior. Uh, I put my my face down. He was on the floor, and I was on my knees on the floor, and I put my forehead against his. And I said, you know, there's something I want to tell you. And I said, Marley, you are a great dog. 
and he was. And that was a changing point for me. I brought his body home, we buried him in the backyard. Our whole family went into this sort of grief and I was, um, I was surprised that children, my wife, myself, we were grieving. And um, it was a few days into it where I realized I need to write the column that tells the whole story about this dog. He wasn't just a, a punchline, a gag. Um, those stories were all true and they made everyone laugh, but there was more to them. So I wrote that column saying goodbye to him. And um, of my career as a columnist, that was the biggest response of a column I ever got. You know, hundreds and hundreds of emails and phone calls came in. And they were some of the most beautiful uh, personal responses. I mean, there was really, a, I really felt a connection in the heart to people who were ostensibly perfect strangers, but we sure felt like we were kindred spirits. Um, and so that column was, I didn't mean it to be. I wasn't trying to, I wasn't thinking about books then. I was just like pouring out of my soul about this experience. But that's when I saw what my book was. I now had an ending. And before that, I had bits. I didn't have the story. I didn't have the conclusion of, this, of the arc. Um, I had this young couple bringing a dog home. And I had him floating around up here. And now I had the story. And that column, my agent later told me, the column was like, basically served as a proposal for a book. Um, so I sent, I, I, I wrote up a letter and I sent it out to I, I think 11 agents or 12 agents I guess. And 11 of them uh, rejected me. One of them took the time to call me up and scold me for wasting her time <laughs> for being a guy who wants to write some stupid book about his dog and I kind of hope she remembers me um, now but <laughs> But I was kind of licking my wounds. And then this, uh, this agent who was just starting out and didn't have a lot of clients took a chance. And um, I said, but I want you to, you know, I think she recognized that as a journalist, I needed deadlines or I'd just sit there and fret. So she said, could I see, you know, I, I want to make sure I feel good about this. Can I see the first chapter by the end of the week? And I was like, by the end of the week? But I did it, you know, I was writing three columns a week and that's about the equivalent of a chapter. So I was getting up early in the morning, like at 4.30 in the morning, and I was writing. Um, and after that chapter went in, she said, no, this is, this is right, You're, I feel that, just how, but keep going, but how about the second chapter at the end of next week? <laughs> and I'm like, oh God, I, I just want, like, can't I just get an advance and then go home and think about it? And now, uh, I think she understood pretty quickly, like, yeah, that would be one of those endless writing processes. Uh, so that's how I wrote the book. I wrote a chapter a week, and at the end of each week, I would send it to the agent. You know, I'm sending a copy, but psychologically, that meant I was done with that chapter. And she counseled me, she goes, don't go back and start editing yourself. It's good enough, it's good enough for right now, and just keep plowing ahead, because the biggest challenge of any writer, and I think everyone knows this, is getting it out of here and getting it onto here. And it can always be fixed once you do that, but as long as it stays locked in here, you have nothing to fix. And she's like, don't stop. Do not start agonizing over prepositional phrases and misplaced gerunds and just move. And so I did that. It took 35 weeks to write 35 chapters. Um, and then you know, we, we sent it out and I had no idea what it was gonna do. She did tell me, she said, you know, if I tried to sell this on a proposal, I'd probably be laughed out of the publisher's office because I'd have to go in and say, yeah, I have a guy who wants to write a story about his crazy dog. And that wasn't going to do it. She said, you know, it's going to really depend on the writing. But with a completed manuscript, she sent it out and we, you know, a, a good situation for any author. We got a competitive bidding thing going. I think there were four uh, publishers bidding on it. Um, we went with William Morrow, um, a good publisher, right? Uh, Harper Collins Group, you know, and they had all the ammunition they needed to like market books properly. Um, and that, but my editor there, he, you know, just another sort of writer story. He said, um, "Now I don't, I know we're all excited about this book, but I don't want you to get your hopes up. You know, this isn't the kind of book that 
you're going to get a lot of critical review on. Like, you know, maybe your hometown paper, the Allentown Morning Call, will want to do something on you. Um, and I was like braced for that. And then like two days before the pub date, uh, Janet Maslin of the New York Times, who's a really tough critic, she, she reviewed it. Um, I didn't even know she was doing it. She reviewed the book and she gave it a good review. And once the New York Times reviews your book, pretty much everybody else reviews your book. Um, and that was really how it started. And, um, and it was off and running. And I came out the very first week at number 10 on the Times list. I thought, oh my God, this is great. I, you know, even if it drops off tomorrow, I can say I was a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> I don't have to tell them it was only for the one week. And then the next week, sure enough, I dropped to 12. There were all these like celebrity books coming out, Jimmy Carter and Winona Judd and Michael Jordan. Al Franken had a book out. And I thought, well, there it goes. You know, then by the third week, I'm going to be off. Um, but something weird happened. After the, on the third week, they went down and I went up. And it took about three or four months, and I hit number one and stayed at number one. I think it was 23 straight weeks. <laughs> so yeah, it was an amazing run. <laughs> so I think the reason I get invited to these things is um, just so you guys can see this guy, like if that f up from sixth grade. <laughs> whose greatest talent was, was exploding milk cartons, if, if he could do this with his idea for a book, every one of you can do it too. And I really do believe that. I've heard some amazing um, voices coming out of the different workshop rooms, the people working on sketches and reading them aloud. And I mean, there's a lot of talent in this room, and I want you to believe in yourself. Uh, don't listen to the naysayers, because there's going to be naysayers, and a lot of it's dr driven by jealousy and or uh, a sense of uh, uh, just cluelessness. They just don't get what it takes. And so they're like, well, this isn't like Stephen King. This will never sell. So you got to believe in yourself. You know, I, I had that naysayer experience, you know, where I, a couple people I worked with, uh, you know, the newspaper industry is horribly backstabbing. There's a lot of insecurities and competitiveness. So they're like, so what are you working on? And I would like confide in one or two people. And I could just see their eyes rolling. Like, this one guy actually said, so I'm working a, on a book on the corruption at City Hall, and you're doing a book on your dog. <laughs> and I mean, it would have been really easy to get discouraged and to say, like, oh, yeah, this is not a book. But I stuck with it, and I urge all of you to stick with your ideas. And, you know, the greatest skill a writer has is fortitude and not giving up and getting that stuff down on paper. So I hope everyone's doing that and will continue to. And I'm going to stop talking now because I've been gabbing away, but I'd love to take some questions from you guys. Thank you. Hi. Um, I loved your book. I'm over here. I loved Marley and Me. I haven't read your other book yet, but I'll go buy it right after this especially if you answer this question. Um, so you, you mentioned, you know, like people saying, oh, this book's not like Stephen King or whatever. And I'm wondering when your agent was pitching this, what kind of comp titles she used or he used? That's a really good question. Thank and you. it's almost kind of embarrassing. So you guys know Mitch Album, right? The uh, Tuesdays with Maury. Um, you know, he was also a, a, a newspaper columnist. He actually worked at my sister paper. I was at the Philadelphia Inquirer. He was at the Detroit Free Press. And Tuesdays with Maury was wildly successful. And their hook was, we're calling it Tuesdays with Marley. And that was their way of saying, like, here's the touchstone point. I actually really hated that. <laughs> but whatever works, right? Um, so so that, that was really kind of what they were going with. Somebody else, come on. Don't leave me up here standing. Yes, ma'am. I just wondered why the name Marley. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, that, that stemmed out of a, uh, an early marital dispute over what to name our dog. <laughs> and uh, Jenny had a certain set of ideas, and I had a certain set of ideas, and we kept clashing, like, well, that's a dumb name. <laughs> well, it's not as dumb as your name. <laughs> And um, as, we were, as we were having this argument, we just, someone absently turned on the tape deck and Bob Marley came on with that great reggae song, Is This Love? You know, it was the song we always loved. And 
and it was still in the room, and we both looked at each other, and it was almost like we'd practiced it. We just, at the same time, we just both said, Marley. <laughs> and that was the end of the discussion, and he was Marley from that day on. So I got to tell you a little funny story about, um, I just thought of it. So I named my dog Marley after Bob Marley. And after the book's been out for a while, I get invited to speak at a Barnes and Noble. And my publicist says, I don't have a good feeling about this because I've never worked with them before. I don't know them. I said, yeah, but I want to do it. You know, I want to do it. They want to introduce me to their readers. So I get down there, and there's like 16 people waiting. And there's a whole row of the Marley books to be signed, and they're Bob Marley, The Inside Story. <laughs> it was the wrong book. They had ordered the Bob Marley book. And so moral of the story, watch what you accept from, yeah, that was, that was one of those cringer moments. OK, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just curious, and I'm wondering if it's a coincidence. Do people tell you, or was it a casting choice that you do sound a little bit like Owen Wilson when you speak? I beg your pardon. Owen Wilson sounds a little bit like moi. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> no, no. Um, we had no input in the cast uh, in the casting on that. Uh, I have to say, though, I, I I really came to really love Owen Wilson and and respect him as an actor. He spent quite a bit of time with me, like sort of asking me questions, and, and he might have just been kind of picking up voice inflections. You know, I got the Michigan twang, and he's got the Texas twang. They're not that far away. Uh, but he also asked me just a lot of questions, like, so in this scene, were you, did you cry? Were you upset? Did you, were you stoic? Um, and he was asking that kind of stuff. Um, and I mean, who wouldn't want to be played by Jennifer Aniston? So. <laughs> So there you go. But no, we had no input. We had no input at all in it. They, they, just, they just told us after the fact. And you know, Owen doesn't look at all like me, but I do think he captured me pretty well. He captured sort of like the inside me. So John, after your Catholic education, can you still say a good act of contrition? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, you're going to put me on the spot. I probably I could probably pull it out of my hat because it's amazing. Like when you go to a Catholic funeral or something, I haven't been in church in a long time. I'll, I'll admit it. Someone gives you the opening line, and off I'm I'm off and running with the <laughs> prayer of the faithful or whatever it is. But um, yeah, you know, my parents really, really, really were devout Catholics, and it meant so much to them. And that's really my second book is wrestling with that issue. When you do not share that level of fervor in faith how do you save a relationship and how do you love each other and respect each other? And I think we figured it out, but it took a lot of painful years to do it. And um, you know, I just, I have a lot of good memories growing up Catholic, not just in a Catholic family, but in a Catholic school and virtually uh, a, a, a whole Catholic neighborhood that surrounded the school. There was the poor Capsonell family, the one Jewish family in our neighborhood, and there was, everybody else was Catholic. But, so it's a good experience, but it also was one that came with some pain for me. How did the book turn out about City Hall corruption? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's funny, because after mine came out, he walked, sorry, he walked up to me, and he kind of just shook his head, and he said, you sold more books this week than I sold in two years with my book. <laughs> but that wasn't saying much. I think he sold like 1,000 copies or something, you know? I mean, so it, it is what it is. It's, it was an important book. Yeah. Did you, after Marley died, have another pet, other dogs, other breeds, yeah, other names? Yeah, no, no other breeds. We are loyal Labrador owners. Uh, we love punishment, apparently. <laughs> uh, we got a female lab after Marley died, and I was kind of a weirdo about that. I had a hard time accepting her. He was like, well, God, she's not as pretty as Marley. She doesn't have his personality. She doesn't, you know, and, and finally, Jenny said, stop. It's a different dog, you know. You got, you know, you gotta like let this go. Uh, she was a great dog. She died pretty young. Um, she got uh, a weird medical thing. And now we have two labs, uh, Woodson and Wallace. They're uh, really mellow. They're like the best dogs we've ever had. Uh, you saw Wallace. Uh, you saw Woodson if you saw the movie. He was one of those adorable little puppies when they picked Marley out, uh, and he was a gift to us from the director of the movie. Um, <laughs> I should have been ogling Jennifer Aniston, but I was spending <laughs> all my energy ogling the puppies. 
And so they, they didn't give me Jennifer Aniston, they gave me a puppy. And I'm glad they did, actually. Uh, wait a second. I guess it's me. Hi, I'm from the Philly area. I so have admired you for some time. I have to say that my husband is the human version of Marley without so much of the H. And so I really love hearing about how people have laughed at all the, the things that you've talked about and that that inspired you to write, because that's what's inspiring me to write a stage play about my life with him. But you know, it's kind of interesting to hear it from an animal perspective. I never thought, even though I read the book, I guess I don't remember the ADHD part of it, <laughs> <laughs> that he really had that diagnosis. So thank you. You, you are welcome. really inspiring me to get it done and do it. And the only difference between writing about your dog and your husband is dogs don't read. <laughs> so good, good luck with that. <laughs> uh, yes, ma'am. Is there a room for a book, a book about cats? I, I, well, th there's been some big bestsellers about cats. There, the one I'm thinking of is Dewey the Librarian Cat. So yeah, I, I mean, people love their animals, and, and people love that relationship with animals. Uh, but again, I think you know, there were a lot of knockoffs, sort of dog knockoffs, after Marley and Me came out. And most of them were kind of crappy, you know, because they weren't, I mean, I got to be honest, there were some good ones, um, but a lot of them were just like formulaic and like, hey, this guy made a lot of money on this, I'm going to try it. And that's the wrong reason to write a book, you know, I mean, it just does not ring uh, true. Um, and, the, and the story of Dewey, the cat, is similar to what I was doing, she was telling us a human story. Um, about loneliness and about you know community and all those things that went into that Did book. I do, but I'm allergic to cats, so we don't have any. But we've had barn cats before, yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. Yes. Were you on the set, and did you collaborate with the screenwriters? Yes and no. I was on the set and Jenny was on the set. Um, we hung out down in Miami for a couple of weeks and then uh, back up and they, they moved filming up to Pennsylvania. Uh, so we were on the set and we were there for the, a lot of the filming and like I said, we talked to the actors about scenes and about how things went down in real life. A little bit, you know, not, not a ton. Uh, but I did not collaborate on the screenplay, and I'm glad I didn't, because once I saw what goes into a screenplay, I realized it's a different set of skills, and I don't got them. Uh, you know, I just, it, it really is. And especially when you're in love with your own story, it's really hard to pare it down. They had to, um, you had to make choices, and you have to uh, consolidate things that are complex into something that's more simple, so you can tell that story in 90 minutes. Uh, the, the one that I'm thinking of is the very handsome actor, Eric Dane from Grey's Anatomy. He plays my best friend uh, in the movie. And in reality, I had like 15 reporter friends who were, he was like a, they boiled them down into him and then made him really good looking. And <laughs> then my one friend, he's this little, little, little short balding man with uh, close set eyes. I'm, it's not like I'm describing myself. <laughs> And he said, so I see uh, they used Eric Dane for me, right? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, Jim, you keep believing that. Um, so what I did have, though, was um, advisement rights. I got to read the versions of the script and give input. And I didn't have any veto power, but I have to say they were respectful. They, um, there were a few things that really bothered me, and they changed them. And the one big addition, if you saw the movie, at the very end, <coughs> when uh, Owen Wilson, as me, is burying Marley, uh, there's a, vo a voiceover, and uh, he's out in the front yard, and there's this vo his voice, voiceover, and that's read almost verbatim out of the book. That was like what I wrote in those final couple pages, um, and that was my idea. Uh, it, there was just going to be this quiet with music, and I said, God, I just hear the voice. I just hear his inner voice. Reflecting, and they went. And they did it. So good for them. A lot of authors talk about the horrible experience when your books turn into a movie, um, and I didn't have that experience. It was actually uh, pretty gentle. I think there's time for one more question. Yeah. Um, your book. You had said that Marley didn't read your 
book, so there was no problem there, but your memoir with your family and the discussions of religion and um, traversing around to the religious places, um, what did they think about that? Well, that's a good question. I kind of took the cowardly approach to memoir writing in that I, I do believe that if you can't write a story honestly, you, you shouldn't write it. You got move on to a new topic. So I just outweighed my parents. Uh, I, I, I really did. I mean, my father was a healthy, sharp as a tack, 89-year-old, and there was no way I was going to write that book in his final years of life because I knew that it would be a really sensitive thing. He already felt like a failure as a Catholic father, the way, you know, trying his best to raise us. Um, but then he got leukemia and he died that year. And I, it was kind of like I felt, I felt freed that I can now tell this story. And, and my mom was um, suffering from some sort of mid-level Alzheimer's and so she wasn't really paying attention. Uh, she was there is that, in that she recognized us and her grandchildren, but she wasn't there to know anything about a story. So I felt free to write that story. Uh, that said, I did get pushback from all my siblings, you know, who all, they didn't dispute the facts of the story, they disputed the tone, like, sort of like, well, I was there, and yeah, it happened, but you seem awfully harsh about it. And so, I mean, I'll, I'll debate tone. You know, what really bothers me as a nonfiction writer is when someone disputes that it ever happened. And you know, you gotta make sure it happened. And, and then you can debate like how you presented it and how fair you were. I heard from a couple of old friends and an old girlfriend who were upset with the presentation uh, like of how they were depicted. And I'm like, yeah, sorry about that. But as someone said it, I think last night, um, that you know, don't write a memoir if you don't wanna step on people's toes. It's just gonna happen because everyone has their own self-conceived notion of how they're the star. And when they're not the star in your version, it's, it's not gonna sit well with them. So yeah, so it was, it was a little painful, but I, I pushed through it and my siblings, uh, and they got through it and they kind of came around where they realized that, you know, it was my story to tell. And my other rule is to tell my story, but not, not to tell their story. So I didn't tell stories that between my parents and my siblings, for instance, because that was their story to tell. Um, so, and I guess it's natural for a child to be protective of a parent. And so I think that's where they were coming from. Like, why would you drag mom and dad out in, in, for, in, to do this? And I'm like, you know, I mean, it was written with love and affection and, you know, I don't feel bad about this. Um, especially having a mother who pricked me with a needle when she kissed me. <laughs> I mean, it, what goes around comes around, right? <laughs> Listen, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your attention. <laughs> Tune for you. Oh, wow. And I wanted to tell you, too, that um, the story that you told <laughs> about the straight pin, I talked a little bit about working with the women in prison and getting people quiet in the prison to do the class. And so that's exactly what I do because I had Sister Concilia, and she would pull her straight pin out, and then I tell the prisoners, I want to be able to do that, you know, imaginary, and to hear the pin drop, and they love it, they love the discipline. But Sister Concilia did not say to me, you will become a writer. She said, Patricia Ann, you will end up in a women's prison. <laughs> and she was and right. So you did a beautiful thank job. You. Thank you beautiful very much. Job. Uh, thank you for that, this is beautiful. I have some announcements. Also, your wife is more beautiful than Jennifer Aniston. She is. <laughs>